welcome to the uh, Greg Kessler edition of the California Nevada chat of Friday, May 12th. My name is Len Dumas, Executive Director for the Northern California Section PGA. Uh, and on behalf of our President Eric Lippert and our colleagues, Executive Director, CEO Nikki Gatch of the Southern California Section and President Eric Lohman, uh, we welcome you and thank you for the continued support uh, of our chats and getting together. And of course, thanks to our on-air on team of Steve Monday and Shelby Zell. Um, more conversation to follow on this topic, but at the moment, let's congratulate our 20 PGA professionals who've earned their way to the PGA Championship next week at Oak Hill. Very, very exciting, including a few from Southern California, which I'm sure Nikki will address later on today. Also, we have the KitchenAid Senior PGA Championship at Fields Ranch East, at Fields Ranch East. Uh, at our new home in Frisco, Texas. And to some extent, that's opening day for Frisco. And so we look forward to that uh, at the end of the month as well. Our guests today of our, our two closest friends named Craig Kessler, COO of the PGA of America and Director of Public Affairs for the Southern California Golf Association. So at this time, before we start the conversation, um, President Lippert was not able to join us, so I'll turn it over to Executive Director and CEO of the Southern California Section, Nikki Gatch. Nikki? Thanks, Len. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I don't have too much to report. We'll we'll get right to the, uh, the Craig Kessler duo here, uh, but I appreciate everybody joining us, and uh, I know we'll have a lot of great information to share with you all. Um, you know, thanks for mentioning our, our, our 20 that will be participating at the championship, Lynn. Uh, we're so excited that three Southern California members uh, will be representing us. And uh, that, that would be Michael Block, no surprise there, Kenny Pigman, and Steve Holmes. Um, so super excited for those three, um, as well as the, the rest of the 20 representing us. So good luck to everyone. And um, thank you all for joining us. Yeah, thank you all so much. So, uh... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Craig Kessler is Chief Operating Officer for the PJ of America. Craig has served as Head of Emerging Concepts at Topgolf from 2016 through 2021, at which time Topgolf went from 25 to 70 facilities and up to 25,000 uh, employees, 25,000 staff members. Uh, Craig graduated from Georgetown University and joined the global management consulting firm of McKinsey and Company and from there became an operating partner at Kohlberg, Kravitz, Roberts, and the company, um, Providence Equity Partners, two private equity firms before joining Topgolf full-time in 2016. Uh, most recently, uh, Craig has served as Chief Executive Officer of Buff City Soap, and under Craig's leadership, Buff City grew from 100 to 260 locations uh, as in his role as CEO, and today, the brand has stores in 32 states. So, Craig, thank you. Uh, I'm sure you're running, 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 and we appreciate you taking some time for us uh, this morning. Len, Nikki, it's great to be here, and I appreciate you having me. So, Craig, let's let's start with, uh, as we just mentioned, some great stuff coming up. I'm sure you'll be headed uh, to Rochester next week. You know, um, so some comments on the great championship, the PGA championship, and then the opening of Frisco with the KPMG senior PGA championship in about a week or two. Looking forward to it. Uh, we'll be in Rochester for a full week starting on, on Monday. And then you said it well, the KitchenAid uh, senior championships coming to Frisco. For those who haven't had a chance to visit Frisco, uh, come on, we'd love to have you. It's spectacular here, 500 room hotel, two acre putting green, uh, two championship golf courses, a stadium lit par three. I could go on, but uh, there's gonna be an incredible test uh, here in two weeks with the seniors. Yeah, Craig, I'm sure that, you know, we've heard about it and we've been fortunate enough to visit a time or two, just the excitement from the folks in the Dallas area and in the Frisco area about the PJ of America headquarters being located there. Yeah, there's a ton of excitement about the headquarters being located here. Uh, I'll tell you, Dallas was on the map, but this puts Dallas on the map in a different way. I mean, already a major sports town, and to imagine PGA Championships, a Ryder Cup, uh, PGA Junior League Championship, one that's near and dear to my heart, also coming to Frisco. It's just, uh, there's a lot of excitement in the air. Yeah, and I think what's really 
special, Greg, is the North Tech Succession headquarters uh, on the property as well with their play park. And to some extent, that's really how the whole project got started. Yeah, Mark Harrison's a great partner. The, the North Texas section of the PGA is, I mean, literally a pitching wedge away from where I sit right now. And uh, to have them so close with, by the way, if you haven't checked it out, uh, one of the assets they've built is called the Ronnie and it's an 18 hole, almost like a pitch and putt for kids. Our kids love going there on the weekends, just an awesome model of a way to grow the game in a relatively low cost and welcoming way. I, I think the North Texas guys have definitely, uh, started something special. Right. And, and that is, uh, of course, a tribute to Ronnie Glanton who's been a North Texas section member, Hall of Fame and such, and has served in all the chairs. So congratulations to everyone uh, regarding uh, Frisco, Texas. So Craig, it's, it's been quite a ride, I'm sure. You know, our onboarding is just how, how hard the hose is turned on. And uh, so some things that you've covered, and you know, I have to commend you for your, I know you're in process now of actually reaching out to all 41 executive directors to have a one-on-one -on -one with them. So Greg, how did you pick off the starting point? If, if, if even it was up to you, I'm sure there were a lot of, can I see you, can I see you, can I see you, can we talk for a few minutes? I'll tell you a quick story. One of the things I learned when I was COO of Top Golf was that in the early days, we made two mistakes. Uh, the first mistake was that we thought the best ideas came from the top and we were totally wrong. The best ideas came from the people who were closest to the action, fighting the fight every single day. The second mistake we made was under communicating instead of over communicating. And so the approach I've tried to take in the two months I've been here is to take a page out of the lessons learned from Top Golf. And it's one of the reasons I'm talking to all 41 executive directors. It's one of the reasons we've hosted numerous dinners with PGA professionals and members from across the country to just listen. Uh, if you saw, it was a little goofy, but incredibly powerful. I spent a full day with Don Ray, our vice president, out at his course, Augusta Ranch, picking the range and working in the kitchen and working in the pro shop just to experience a day in the life of what it's like to be you know, many of the folks on this call. Uh, so so that's, the, uh, that's the approach I've taken. I'll tell you, in the early days, I'm learning a ton. Uh, some patterns are starting to emerge, but one of the things that's clear is this is a wildly magical but complex organization, and it's going to take a little bit longer to actually have a clear set of uh, priorities in terms of what we go attack from here. And and the, the key, Craig, is it's positive. You know, we're grateful for the state of the game right now. Uh, how we got here is a little questionable. Well, I don't know that necessarily want to go through that again. Yeah. But, uh, you know, as you mentioned earlier, PGA Junior League is booming. Our drive, chip, and putt uh, is booming in programs around the country. And so, Greg, one of the things that came out of COVID was uh, the playbook, you know, the golf playbook, which was a joint venture between our allied associations. Yeah. And certainly part of the magic of that was bringing a couple of doctors from the CDC and to help with that. Do you feel, Craig, from your, your time there and also your time at Top Golf, you've been involved in the industry that are it brought us together. And if something like that is not going to bring us together, then holy mackerel, I don't know what would be. Do you feel that the associations were still aligned uh, to the common goal? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. You you can feel it in conversations that happen. Uh, on the golf course, most recently at Augusta at the Masters. Um, it, it's just incredible to see what good can come from the allied associations coming together to support each other. And I think you may have Fred Propal from the USGA coming on this afternoon. I mean, Fred, uh, Fred was a mentor to me in Dallas as soon as we, my wife and I moved here six, seven years ago. And I think when you can take relationships and friendships like that and bring them to bear across uh, all of the associations and organizations that influence golf, you know, amazing things can happen. Yeah, Mr. Propal is unable to join us, um, Craig, so we'll catch up with him uh, in July, it looks okay. like at this point, right? That's, that's and, great. Yeah, yeah, terrific. You know, to some extent, Craig, the, the, the deferred comp plan, which is now rolling out and having some success as we look at the registrations and people starting to submit their 
their credits, hours, if you will, is that that was our first get together with the IRS to pass that member benefit along. And yeah. uh, do you see it that way? I mean, uh, yeah. Well, I, I think it's a tremendous benefit. I've now spoken to 20 of the 41 section executive directors, and I ask all of them three questions. The first question is, what's one thing the PGA can do to better serve sections and EDs? The second question is, what's one thing we can do to better serve the member? And the third question is, what's one thing we're doing well that we shouldn't screw up? And uh, almost uniformly, when I get to the third question, EDs talk about the importance of deferred compensation. Uh, at this point, we have a few thousand members who've signed up. We should triple that number. I mean, this is an absolute no-brainer. What a great way to protect your future, make a little bit more money, and continue to grow the game and serve the association. I, if you're on this call and you haven't signed up, do it. Please. Craig, um, in, in regards to what Lynn mentioned about the boom that we've all seen, you know, since COVID and, and it's been so great for our game, um, what what do you think are, are going forward in the future would be the biggest challenges, not only for our industry as a whole, but specifically for our PGA members and um, what sort of approach uh, do you see you and your team taking to, to help continue to help our, our PGA members, you know, overcome those challenges? It's a great question, Nikki. I, I think there's a few things. Uh, and some of this I've experienced, some of this I'm hearing from the listening tour that I'm currently on. Number one, I think we're tired. Uh, it's been a very, very difficult, while successful, difficult and challenging ride post-COVID. And we're tired. Uh, and that's something we can't ignore. Uh, I don't know what the solve for that is. We have some ideas, but it's one we have to acknowledge. Uh, I think, too, I mean, golf peaked. It's still at an all-time high. And the question is, what happens from here, given the macroeconomic headwinds we may be facing? Uh, if we do face a recession, figuring out how to navigate that collectively is something we're really going to need to lean into. I think the third thing, and this is more of an opportunity than a challenge, but uh, innovation in golf is pretty remarkable at the moment. I mean, you're seeing stadium lit par three golf courses show up. You're seeing things like the Ronnie, which we talked about. You're seeing indoor putting concepts like the puttery and, and others, um, you know, obviously top golf drive shack and others. The, the, the pace of innovation is incredible, both on green grass golf courses and outside of it. And I think one of our challenges and opportunities is figuring out how to harness that for good both in terms of creating opportunities for members and also creating opportunities to introduce the next generation into a sport that we love. Let's, uh, let's talk about uh, the sport that we all love. And, you know, can you share your golf journey with, with us? We talk so much about, you know, what is everyone's golf journey, you know, as a golfer and then ultimately um, as, a, as a career. But um, if you could talk about that. Please. Yeah, I'd love to. I'll spend just 30 seconds on it. I don't want to bore anyone, but it's given that I was born and raised in Carlsbad, California. It's uh, it's kind of a fun one to share with this group. Uh, so I grew up in Carlsbad. We grew up uh, playing uh, Encinitas Ranch, which we excuse me, not Encinitas Ranch, uh, Carlsbad. Um, Rancho Carlsbad. Rancho Carlsbad, which we <laughs> referred to as the cow pasture back then. There, there wasn't a blade of grass on the entire golf course. And, you know, I went back with my kids recently and it brought back so many wonderful memories. Uh, and after Rancho Carlsbad, you know, I think by the time we were in middle school, uh, our moms would all drop us off at uh, Lake San Marcos Executive Golf Course, which I think was recently rebranded to St. Mark's and then something else. And for $9, we could play unlimited golf in the afternoons in the summertime. And if we were lucky, our moms would give us an extra buck for a Snickers bar, which was our version of lunch. Uh, so, so that's what I did growing up as a, as a kid. Uh, when we moved to Dallas, we really got serious about golf. My, my wife took lessons during her second maternity leave from Gabe Reynolds, who just qualified for the team of 20 a top golf teaching professional who will be representing us, obviously, in Rochester next week. Uh, we have three boys, three, five, and seven years old. Uh, our five and seven-year-olds are in PGA Junior Leagues. They do it at the local Muni course, Tennyson, uh, in Dallas. And I have to tell you, well, we don't keep many things sacred in our family in terms of 
clocking the calendar. Uh, Thursday nights are sacred in our house. My wife and I pour ourselves a cocktail. We bring a little boom box and we caddy for our kids uh, at Tennyson. And it's, it's just an absolute blast. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing. We'll have to get you back here for a round at Rancho Carlsbad soon. I'll see you this summer. Let's do it. <laughs> Sounds good. So, so Craig, on, on that note, you know, we have PJ Junior League moving to uh, Frisco now uh, for the uh, national championships, which is amazing. Uh, yeah. the, the finals uh, this year, you know, the finals for the drive, chip and putt at Augusta on Sunday. I mean, they, they covered it wall to wall. It's just incredible. And I, I draw that parallel to Top Golf in the sense that we're moving to golf as a very, very social event. Yeah. And even taking the labels off, for instance, it's PGA Junior League. Another way we could look at it as just team golf. Uh, adults can play it too, and so on and so forth. So I think I think we're getting better at that, at socializing the game and really taking taking it more to the consumer and say, how would you like to go about this? Well said. Uh, you know, somebody asked me the other day, uh, what, why was Top Golf successful? And there are a bunch of reasons. But if I had to put my finger on one thing, Top Golf welcomed everyone and made it comfortable for you to bring your whole self to a Top Golf venue. Doesn't matter what you look like, what you believe in, what you wear, you are welcome. You are welcome at a Top Golf. And there's a time and a place for you know all different types of environments in traditional green grass golf. Um, you know, we're members at a private club here in Dallas, and there are certain things and customs and traditions that I think are very important to that private club. And frankly, it's an awesome opportunity for us to teach our kids about those traditions and customs. And I love it. There's also a time and a place to introduce people to green grass golf for the first time and say, it's okay if you wear your Lululemon pants and you wear flip flops and you come ready to have a great time. And as long as we're finding avenues and on ramps to welcome people, just as Top Golf, I think, has done a pretty good job. I, the the social future, the the future of golf, is incredibly bright. Craig, to that event, uh, to that extent, you know, it's it's incredible where the competitive lay the competitive level is at junior golf at the moment. You know, th those are pretty big deals, but the fields are busy. The events are packed all over the country, whichever association it is, junior and national. And we've hit that point where we've had, we have, if you will, graduates now of PGA Junior League that are very successful college players. And uh, Patrick Cantley's, I think it's a great example, been through the junior tour in Southern California. So uh, that speaks really well for us because they are turning out to be wonderful ambassadors for the game. Hopefully the trend continues. We had the grand opening of PGA Frisco and the Omni Hotel and Fields Ranch golf courses last week. And the general manager of the hotel got up and said, one day we're going to have a PGA champion who started his or her golf career right here in our backyard. I hope that's true. You, you know, I'm sure we will, uh, Craig. I'm, I'm sure we will. So I, as we move along, Greg, we, you know, we've got a couple of issues in front of us now. One is the ball rollback, right? And uh, not that, you know, we didn't start that one, but we fortunately, and it's in the common period for the USGA at the moment in our position. And uh, Craig, talk a little bit about, you know, what happens before we get the word about the our stance as the PGA of America on some of those larger issues, certainly even, even the designated events you know, that the tour has come up with for the, for the season and future. Yeah, look, I appreciate you asking, and I want to be thoughtful and careful in my comments because it's still early days of figuring out exactly what's going to happen here. You know, I, I think the USGA has made it clear that they're in a listening period now where they're interested in hearing feedback. And my encouragement to everybody on this call is to take advantage of that, uh, share feedback so that your voice can be heard and, and accounted for in what ultimately happens. You know, I, I think our stance is there are some real things to be concerned about. Uh, if whatever gets implemented is hard to monitor and leaves room for uh, complexity in what should be a relatively simple world. So, you know, the, the, personally, there's some fun and enjoyment in being able to compare how far I hit compared to some of the pros who are out there. And 
if I'm a teaching professional, there's value in being able to take a student who's today hitting the ball 230 yards and getting him or her to hit the ball 240 yards. And all these things need to be taken into account before the world moves forward. And, and again, I think we have a little bit of time here before the final game plan gets cemented. Absolutely, Craig. The, the public opinion period is open, I believe, through the middle of August. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, a, a very, very large undertaking. So, Craig, how do you see us moving along as an organization? There's growth. I think there's growth on, on two levels. One, yes, some have, now that we are not the only game in town, which we literally were during the pandemic, other sports have opened. There's been some follow-up, but the courses are still crowded. The courses, T-sheets are still full, uh, which is great. And and how do you see us maintaining that? And I really, during the, when the, the chat started, it was all about the pandemic and guiding everyone through. And we applauded, you know, our colleagues around the country and internationally for sticking to the protocols because that's what allowed us to reopen. And those protocols are still in place. See us maintaining, Craig, and as we have something like uh, Frisco opening up new headquarters, more invitations, junior leagues still growing and junior tours still growing locally that we're going to keep riding this way for a bit. Totally. I'm incredibly optimistic about the future. Uh, a few data points. I mean, junior leagues continue to grow. The number of students that are entering our programs to become PGA members, it's growing. Uh, the talking golf, it's no longer just about, you know, traditional golf, and there's still an enormous amount of talk about that. But as you've pointed out, off course golf, it's absolutely exploding and introducing new people into the game we love and, you know, still having some friends over at Top Golf, and you can read about what Chip Brewer and Artie Stars at, at Callaway and Top Golf have to say about the growth of that business. There's so much runway ahead of them that I just continue to be uh, very bullish on the future. Craig, you brought up a very important point, and we heard the good news from uh, our career consulting team about a week ago, two weeks ago, that is uh, PGM enrollment is up for the first time uh, in quite a long time. And, uh, you know, there we have the universities across the country, but that, I think, is a very strong barometer about the state of the game. Totally. We've got 50 students downstairs right now who are going through one of their in-person seminars and it's a pretty pretty invigorating room to 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 be in because these folks are just so excited to have careers in golf. Now, I will tell you, one of the first things I did when I started here is I went online and uh, tried to become a PGA member, at least start the process. And I think it might be easier to register to become a NASA scientist or maybe even astronaut than it is in some respects to become a PGA member. In fact, when we tried doing it, we got log jam so many times we had to call the 1-800 number to speak to our membership office and as soon as I finished paying my $250 to start my Q level the first pop-up that showed up said would you like to make another payment instead of congratulations welcome to the start of your journey in becoming a, a PGA professional and if you look at some of the most well-respected successful businesses out there one of the things they do is they remove friction and they make it as easy as possible for people to become a part of the calling. And I can only imagine how much better we can get and the level of talent we can bring in if we do that. And I, you know, it's one of the things we're going to do over the next several months and years is figure out a way to recruit the most incredible talent into our ranks so that PGA professionals continue to be elevated as they deserve to be. Yeah, uh, Craig agree. And, and we actually, I only bring it up because, because you did. Uh, we actually have a, a group of our board of directors and myself uh, working on localizing or gathering the education and how to become a member materials for our own local library. So we did the same exercise of going online, particularly after one of our board members said they sent their son to figure out how to become a PGA member and came back just all, all glazed over. Yeah, we use words and phrases that mean a lot to us internally, but to a, a newcomer don't make sense. So you go on, it says, do you want to become an affiliate or an associate? And my answer is a, a member. Like, wh how do I do that? And anyways, the point is we'll figure out how to tell our story. And, and their growth issues, Craig, and their positive growth issues. I, I think it's important to say that as well. Conversation came up last year 
or probably or possibly 18 months ago about re further recognition, additional recognition for members at the 50 year level. Totally. And so on and so forth. And, and so I think those are all very, very positive. Yeah. Totally agree. So Craig, putting, putting uh, next week, we know where you are uh, in Rochester. That's going to be great. Uh, PJ championship. One of the, one of the incredible parts of the PJ championship is, you know, here's an unashamed PGA coach advertisement, you know, watch the, watch the banners come across the screen. I mean, that in itself is a tremendous move and certainly fosters encouragement to become a PGA coach and uh, a great move by the PGA. To to totally agree and looking forward to seeing it all come to life. So what's next, Greg, what's next on the, on the to-do list? Oof, uh, we only have a half an hour, right? Uh, there's a lot on the to-do list. I, you know, look, I think that there are a couple of really big priorities. One is to get out into the field, meet as many members as possible, walk in your shoes uh, and listen, like listen very, very intently. Uh, and then based on everything, I and the team here come up with a revised set of priorities and initiatives to go after. I think the second thing is we have this incredible asset in our new headquarters here in Frisco, and we have an opportunity to take a good culture and make it great. Uh, I had a boss who once said, I hope you feel like you get to go to work. You don't have to go to work. And I think if we can create this magical culture where people get to go to work here in Frisco and that trickles down, some, some really special things uh, will come of it. And, and, and then, you know, last but not least, getting out to our championships. I mean, I'll obviously be in Baltusrol uh, in June for the KPMG Women's. Uh, we've got Ryder Cup coming up and having a chance to take it all in, meet industry partners and leaders is, uh, is something I'm really looking forward to. Craig, I've got one more for you and thank you for your time again. And as you mentioned there, we also now have our students coming out, level two students and such coming out to HQ to continue their education. Do you have a, an occasion to chat with them periodically or just, or just perhaps even just take some pride for what's been developed there and how we're bringing along our future members? Short answer is yes, uh, absolutely. And then some, w one of my favorite memories or experiences in the two and two months or so that I've been here. Um, Cameron Doan, who's the head professional out at Preston Trail, he and I co-hosted a dinner for nine uh, pros who were in the Dallas area, seven of them assistant professionals, two of them head professionals. And for three hours, we just told stories and it was a chance for me to ask questions about what's good about the PGA, where can we do a better job? And the chance to interact with you know, nine and in many cases up and coming leaders in the PGA and in the Dallas area. It was awesome. And uh, we're looking forward to hosting additional dinners like it in the future. And uh, finally, Craig, was there anything in the notes about BJ Frisco being in headquarters about Nikki being such a Cowboys fan? And does that have any influence yeah. that we know about? Well, being that Nikki and I are both from San Diego, or at least have lived in San Diego at different points, we're certainly not Chargers fans anymore. Can tell you that much. <laughs> America's team, Craig. America's team. Well, we God's look, team. There you go. I like that. Um, <laughs> we we look forward to having you out here. I know you're going to make a, a a short trip out this summer, so we look forward to connecting with you. And uh, I know you'll be up to to visit Lynn soon. And uh, we hope to have you, I believe, at our annual meeting this December. So. Thanks for thanks for your time today, and thanks for the time that you've uh, you've spent and will spend with with Lynn and myself and uh, the other EDs and and section members. So we appreciate it and welcome aboard. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for all of your support and to everybody out there in the field making a difference in in people's lives. Really admire what you're doing, and I hope I get a chance to meet you all in person soon. Thank you, Craig. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Okay, that was great, and uh, I really appreciate uh, Craig taking his time to join us today. And uh, okay, on to now our Director of Government Affairs for the Southern California Golf Association, uh, Craig Kessler. Craig, we had our uh, California Alliance for Golf legislative call this morning, so there's some information coming out about that, particularly what's happening at this time of year in Sacramento regarding the state budget 
and what happens to the bills that have been introduced and such. And then uh, also we had a shorter meeting with the uh, California Golf Course Owners Association and covered some additional topics. So Greg picked them off one by one, but perhaps let's start with letting everybody know what's happening at the Capitol. The deadlines are coming up. And, and, and I think something very important that we talked about was the change in a potential change uh, of the Speaker of the House. I'm tempted to say, Len, you're as bad as I am. You just gave my whole, you just gave my whole talk, but, but, I, but, I, but that would be in bad taste and not in my character, so I won't do that. Before I do, just one comment. I, I, I think the much younger version, much younger and better looking version of myself is off the call now, but whether he knows it or not, there's a third Craig Kessler that we know of in the United States, an extraordinarily accomplished and famous epidemiologist from Johns Hopkins. So as important as these two Craig Kesslers you have on this call today may, may think we are, that one, has, that one has actually done God's work. And one more comment about that. It's a well-known fact that America's team actually plays in America's capital. And I'll just leave it at that and move onward. So <clears throat> while we were in this discussion or while we we're on this call, um, the governor actually unveiled his budget literally while, we, while we've been on. And I'll, get to, and I'll get to that in a moment, the, but the deficit is much bigger than he predicted a few months ago. But I'll get to that in a second. I just wanna take note for everyone, speaking of what's going on in the Capitol, that one year ago today, we were in the last seven days of, a, of, of actually drinking from a fire hose. We were, we were trying to defeat Assembly Bill 1910, which we had defeated in its first version, which had a different number in the previous session, 672. Uh, and for those who don't recall, I hope you all recall on this, on, this, on, this, on this call, that that would have provided hundreds of millions of dollars of free money to developers in small cities to take their municipal golf courses, which are 22.3% of the stock in the state of California, and chop them into housing complexes which would have been a devastating blow for golf. We just heard all the positive things going on, all the growth, the junior league, all the indicators are the popularity of the game, whether it's indoors or outdoors, virtual or real. And then the biggest problem is we have nowhere to play. And if we lose facilities in this context, it's very difficult to grow and diversify a game if you lose the very places where growth and diversity are most likely uh, to happen. So, Last year, we were faced with that. In previous sessions, obviously, you've heard much today about COVID. Um, I always have to add when the subject comes up that we actually started playing golf in, in most of Southern California before much of the rest of the nation. And I recall being deeply flattered. I know that Kevin Fitzgerald and I got calls from tennis and other outdoor activities asking how we did it. And I think we should wear that as a point of pride. How we did it was being active on the ground in our advocacy. And something that you said, Len, we as, a, we as a sector were really able to perform and behave well with the whole world looking at us. I think we forget now that during COVID, because we were the only game in town for a long time, Eyewitness News and every newspaper reporter was out there trying to trip us up in, in violating the protocols. And, and, and my hat is off, not just to the professionals and the GMs who are on this call, but to all the golf rank and file golfers out there that performed so admirably when the world was looking at us and that allowed us to keep playing. And that opened the door to, in, to enticing so many persons who played golf, who hadn't played golf or hadn't or had stopped playing golf because it was the only game in town to go out there. And they discovered something that everyone on this call knows, it's the greatest game. And so once you once you play it a little bit, you're not going to stop playing. And of course, I think as other games in town have come back to into to the fore and we're able to do more things, we're holding most, if not all, of that golf audience. I see the greatest challenge in Southern California's urban areas as being can we keep them if they can't get tea times anywhere, or they can't get memberships in private clubs. And that's been our greatest challenge. And that's exactly where AB 1910. Uh, really hit us, hit us, and it was such a visceral concern of ours because had we lost courses wholesale, based on that, we, the problem would have been uh, that much more acute than it, than it is already. And let me add, a year ago, we were faced with that. COVID, just before that, we were faced in, re, pre, in recent sessions with 
gas powered equipment, glyphosate, neonicotinoids, and I'll talk about that in a minute because we're doing well on it this year. And everyone on this call certainly viscerally remembers um, uh, two versions of independent contracting after a particularly awful Supreme Court ruling. We had AB5 and then AB2257. And uh, we did uh, uh, rather well on those things. My point is this, this year, we're not drinking from a fire hose. We are watching bills. We're watching the usual land use bills that long-term have some consequence. Certain water and land and bills that we know are probably gonna pass. They're, they're common sense uh, extensions of what's been going on for some years. But we're, we don't have any of the kinds of things that I think that go directly to us and at us. So we're not, not as active. And that's good because, well, if nothing else, some of us needed just a little bit of a, a rest. But that's given us an opportunity to maybe take a look at how we're doing things. And you know that, Len, uh, as, a, as, a, as the vice president of the California Alliance for Golf, to look at how we're organized because, again, we're not, in, we're not in a fire drill. We're not, we're not in a panic. But we are watching certain things, and I want to share that with this audience. Most of what we're looking at is to try to see what happens next week in the appropriations process in both the Senate and the Assembly to see whether or not those same realities and arrangements on the Colorado River Basin that are, we know th those days have come to an end where all of the arrangements that date back to 1922 that were taken together with the right, with the senior rights, the priorities, uh, all of the, all the, all the quantification agreement settlements and the various amendments to those things, those are all still predicated upon a, a river basin that, that produces 17 million acre feet of water per year. Uh, and we over allocated it hundred years ago. Well, it's only producing between about 12 and 13 million. And I, this is an important point for everyone to understand. Mother Nature bailed out California, which is, in a, which is very different from the Colorado Basin and the Rockies this year with, in, with record snows and rains and our reservoirs have filled. Uh, and that really bailed us out. It was a definite godsend because had we had a fourth year like the previous three, we'd be in water rationing right now. And of course, I think everyone understands golf's position when that day would hit. So we're bailed out. And, but again, we understand that as incredible volatility. We have these amazing wet years, we have dry periods. We still believe we're in somewhat of a drying and warming period of aridification. So that's great news for that major, one of the major sources of the water that's imported in the southern part of the state in particular, but the Colorado Basin it got a little bit of relief, but not much. Lake Powell and Lake Mead are not in danger of falling below the critical mass of water necessary to produce electricity, that is true, or providing drinking water in the short run to Phoenix and Tucson in particular, but they didn't restore much. And we're gonna, we're gonna draw that water down in no time flat. So at, we're in a position right now where we understand that all of those seven states, particularly California, which has the most to lose because we have the most rights, are in the process of really posturing with each other, dancing and threatening. And that's gonna go on for a period of time. If it goes on too long, the federal government will simply come in and start ordering. Now, legally, many of you who understand that, does the, does the United States government really have the jurisdiction to control water once it enters the state of Arizona or California? The technical answer is probably no. But the real answer is that the federal government has a lot of tools at its disposal to discipline the states to get together and make some agreements. That's a great unknown. All we know for sure is those allocations will be less. And this is probably the year of decision in which that amount of what that less equals, uh, you know, we'll end up knowing what that is. And for the first time, the Coachella Valley, which is never really, I mean, for political reasons and maybe optical reasons, oftentimes they've been forced to conserve, but it's, it's, it's really been phony. This is the first time there will be some actual cuts and there'll be some impact there. That impact will be a fraction of what it is in the coastal areas, uh, but they've never had to face it before. And sometimes the first time you face something is the hardest. And, and so that's something that's sifting through the consciousness and, and, and into the culture of the desert. 
And I'm actually seeing those results. I'm, I'm seeing that happen and I'm, I'm encouraged by it. The good news there is the relationship with the water agencies, Coachella Valley Water District or the Desert Water Agency are so good and so close that, uh, that, that, that getting from where we are to where we need to be in that part of the, that part of the state which I tend to focus on because it's the home to 120 golf courses. We have a lot of deserts. We only have one with 120 golf courses. And that's why we put a lot of focus. But back to the legislature, because I know, Len, you're giving me a bit of an admonished look right now, that it, we're looking at certain bills like AB 460, and that's count, uh, somewhat of a counterpart in the Senate, 389. And they strike us as the same opening of the discussion that's going on in the Colorado Basin, that all the old pre-1914 water rights that we thought were sacred, they're sacred in law, or what we call riparian rights, or some of the old arrangements, you know, the first in can draw it almost indefinitely and not worry about the guy down, down river, that those things, which primarily affect agriculture at the moment, but ultimately every water is fungible. There's only so much of it and every, every decision uh, filters down and it's gonna filter down to the golf community as well statewide. What we're seeing is the beginning of the unraveling of those things as well. What we're waiting is whether that moment has come in 2023 or maybe has to wait till 2024, 2025 or 2026. If some of these bills die in appropriations, they are opposed by the California Chamber of Commerce, by the Farm Bureau, and probably most importantly for water issues by the Association of California Water Agencies. Those three in combination usually spell death to any bill, but that may not happen this year. And if it doesn't, it'll be a key indicator to us that that day too is over and that we need to get about making those adjustments. That may sound a little esoteric to a lot of persons listening in the call, listening on the call, but how many times, whether you've heard me say it, you've heard Len say it, you've heard Tom Addis, Nikki Gatch, you're going to hear us all say it, that what we're trying to do is get years out in front of trends, a couple of years out in front of bills, that once language goes into a bill and has some traction, if we're just reacting at that point, we've, all, we've probably already lost. And that's one of the reasons... I, I point out whether it's 19, whether in this year's bill on neonicotinoids, a bill that posed some issues for the golf community last year, blew through both houses of the legislature, but the governor vetoed it. And some of the reasons he gave for the veto were eerily similar to some of the reasons that we issued objections. So as a result, there's another bill in 2023, but the one that's on its way to passage this year and probably signature by the governor is one that contains all of the sorts of suggestions, amendments, and mitigations that we talked about last year. That's what I would call progress. And that was what I would call evidence of, a, of the golf industry being proactive in the state. And those, are the, and those are the kinds of benefits that you can receive when you operate in that particular forward looking fashion. So taken together, if you look at that, you look at some of, we did better than most states on glyphosate. Uh, we had some help from the Cal EPA on that. Uh, we did passably well on, uh, uh, good enough in, in two iterations of independent contracting bills. We handled ourselves admirably when, it, when we were dealing with COVID. And of course, we, they, a bill took direct aim at us uh, in 672 and 1910. They took aim at us because they thought we were politically weak. They had more money. I can tell you that now. They had more support. They had more assets, and they were better organized than we were. But for the first time, I think, in the history of golf in California, we finally used something, at least in the southern half of the state, we used something that we had never used before, and that surprised them. About over 3 million people in this state play golf, and if they can be engaged on something like 1910, that's what does the, that's what makes the difference in politics. So just as you heard the other Craig Kessler earlier encourage you on an issue that's very specific to the golf industry dealing with the with the with, with the USGA's comments period on the distance uh, distance uh, rules, um, it's important. Make I would encourage you make your voices heard. That you can do, and, and if you do that, you'll never have any regrets. If you fail to do it and maybe don't like the result, you will always regret it. And I think the same thing applies for us here. Bottom line, I think I, I'm, I'm sort of I want to get to the conclusion of all that, and and it's very simply that we've done well in recent years. 
And I think there's some very solid reasons we've done well, and we ought to pat ourselves on the back. And as I said in, in the call this morning, uh, the CAG Legislative Committee that Len referred to, that you know, so much of the rest of the country looks at us and they probably identify us as this deep blue hellhole that they have this notion that everything bad that affects them comes out of California. Well, here's the truth. We've done better on the same issues than most, if not all of them have done. And again, that is a tribute, I think, to what, even though I'm sure some of the, my colleagues listening on this call know, Craig, aren't you the guy who always whines that we're not doing good enough and we have to do better? The answer to that's yes. And some of you do the same thing. But I think it's that kind of urgency and it's that kind of sense of wanting to get better and do better that is that is able that allows us to be able to look back over the last four or five years and 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 conclude that given some pretty tough circumstances and a pretty tough political arena to operate in, we're doing well. So let's let's double down on those things that have gotten us to doing well and not slide back and particularly not become complacent when we do get wins. It's a tough arena. Luck plays a role in some of these wins. And, and then I'll go into one of, the th one of the things that I think really helped us in 1910 and some of these other events. And, and Len alluded to it. So he's, see, Len, I didn't, I didn't ignore totally your tee up. He's smiling. I got him to smile. That's good. You look better when you smile than when you're frowning at me. Or that confused look like, what's he talking about? And I'm not so sure I want to have him keep talking. But nonetheless, here I go. So the speakership has been... Um, in Anthony Rendon has been in the southern part of the state, which meant that some of the key um, chairmanships were in the southern part of the state, and even some, like the Budget Committee, Phil Ting of San Francisco. For those who don't know, Phil is an avid golfer, about a five handicap. He loves the game of golf, and he's been the chair of the Budget Committee. Well, when we switched speakerships, we, we believe that the, the, some of the things will shift up north and, and, um, and some people who actually thought 1910 was a good idea may take some of these key chairmanships. When Robert Rivas uh, replaces Anthony Rendon, who's pretty much in his last term, and that's why in office, and that's why the shift is happening. Robert Rivas, uh, I believe, lives in Hollister. He his district tends to be more of Salinas, but you get an idea where he's from. There's a lot of agriculture. There is some golf, and uh, we're told that he plays golf and likes golf, and that's good. But I also remember that at the uh, that he was a little bit keen. I don't think he really knew what was in 1910, but he voted for it, at least in committee. I don't know what he felt longer term. I'm very encouraged that some of you in the northern part of the state have been making, have been opening up relationships uh, with his office. There's more, there's, we, there's work that needs to be done in the northern part of the state at the grassroots level. Consistent with the theme I talked about, uh, getting years out in front and becoming proactive. In the 1910 campaign, and I think it came as a great shock to the author, Christina Garcia, who is out of office now. And I might point out, she was termed, well, she decided before she was, two years before she was termed out to make a run for the 42nd Congressional District. It was not a very successful run, so she's not in any office at this particular point. Her uh, successor, Blanca Pacheco, is a golfer and has actually requested to speak to the California Alliance for Golf. So I think we can, that's, a, that's an incredible irony and, and a happy irony I'm happy to, to share with you. But I think what Christina Garcia discovered, she had this rather narrow attitude that maybe many of her colleagues, similarly situated colleagues, who represented working class, perhaps heavily minority districts in the urban core, might have her same negative view of golf that, that, she, that she had. And turns out they didn't, that they had rather positive views of the values that, that the golf courses in their district brought, municipal, particularly the municipal golf courses, which, which is what the bill aimed at. And I would so, I, and so, and I would say the result of that, that doesn't happen overnight. That doesn't happen because slick guys like, like, like me goes into an office and says, oh, you know, you don't really understand golf. These, these are the talking points. It's really this or this or this. This happens because of 10, 20, 30 years of work at the grassroots. Something, the guy with my same name, who's going to be more important to you than I'm ever going to be because he's your chief operating officer of the, your professional organization, but something he said that, uh, that I've said in so, many, in so many ways in the thing that he discovered when he worked at Topgolf, it's always the people at the bottom who understand life the best. 
It's always those who work it every day, who understand what works and what doesn't work. And that the real role of some of us who have positions of maybe authority and so forth is not to, is not to assume that we know best and can tell every you know can walk into communities and tell them what they need. We really need to go on those listening tours. And I mention it here because we've been doing that in Southern California for a long, long time, particularly in the public sector, the municipal sector, is engaging with those communities, engaging with those offices, and getting them to see golf as this great societal value proposition, not just to those who play golf in their districts, but those who don't play golf in many ways. And I would say that's how we win all those campaigns. You're the other Craig Kessler's comments about lessons learned from top golf that he's going to apply in his position with the PGA of America is something that I always lament, it, particularly as some of our national organizations, it, this is very apropos to National Golf Week. I'm always saying, why don't you listen more closely to people who actually do this every day on the ground? And what I do on the ground is a little bit different. It's actually figure out what arguments work in a local setting, what arguments work on a piece of legislation or a piece of regulation, and what arguments don't work. And in fact, some cases, what arguments is oftentimes golf thinks work for us I see them as the other guy's argument. And long ago, I learned that the other guy is going to leave with, lead with his or her argument. Don't you lead with it, because then that'll be the metric by which the whole case is decided, and it won't go well for you. I won't go into details, but some of you read the stuff that Kevin Fitzgerald and I point out. You know, you know our opinion on the utility of economic reports. Um, so... And I won't go in, I won't belabor that point, particularly right now, but I'm, we're going to keep hammering it away till those at the top who like to buy those things off a shelf because it's easy, understand that sometimes the things that are effective are those things that are hard and those things are learned at the level. So I'm going to look back at Len now. I talked for probably over 20 minutes in a filibuster. And so I'm going to guess that I covered things that he didn't think I was going to cover, but I hope they were pertinent. And I may have not covered something that you had asked me to cover. So if I didn't, I'm going to throw it back to you, Len. And then you can ask a question that'll get me back on the focus and on the track before we before we say goodbye to everybody. I, I think we covered what's important, Craig, as you always do. Thank you. So I will just clarify for everyone. Uh, you know, Craig mentioned AB 1910. AB 1910 was, for, for everyone may or may not know, you know, incentives from the state of California, incentives provided to local agencies that owned golf courses to convert them into open space. So you see the threat immediately was to the golf industry. And as Craig said, we were able to defeat that. And I and also, uh, as politics go, there were some surprises to the authors along the way uh, and who didn't realize that there were so many people, even in their districts, who were fans of golf and were against the bill. So just a little on that 1910. We talked about this last month during our, our April chat, but I, I think it's important, Greg, that um, the California Alliance for Golf is represented by all of the all the partners here uh, in California, uh, both professional organizations, both amateur bodies, the superintendents association, and on and on and on and on. And so we visited the Capitol, we visited Sacramento, uh, with appointments set up from our lobbyist, Tony Rice, uh, at the end of March, and it was just terrific. And I think we, we had, we met with senators, we met with our Congress people, we met with the staff members, and so on. I think what, the great takeaway from that, Craig, and you alluded to it, was the relationships. One, they took the appointment to talk to us, and there were a bunch of us. There were 10, 11 of us, and they were willing to meet with us, too. You, you know, you get the time that you get with each one of them. If it's seven minutes, that's what you get. If you get 10, you know, that's great. But, you know, the conversations were very social. And they started out, in many cases, asking us, is there anything out there that concerns you? And we were able to respond to that. Part two was, during those conversations, and I think it's just, I take it as a symbol of, of working together and understanding us more, us being the golf industry, here are some things you should put on your radar. You know, they're not at the top of the radar. In other words, they were telling us that there's something on page 786 of this particular bill that you might just want to be aware of. So I think we came away stronger than we went in. Craig, and now, as you mentioned, you know, with Speaker Revis coming in, we have another 
advocate. We have someone that we know, as you mentioned this morning on our calls, uh, is is an advocate and, and a player of the game of golf. W would you say that, would you agree with that, that coming away from uh, our day at the Capitol, that we might even be a little stronger uh, than we I would uh, say yes, that was a, an excellent exercise that sort of confirmed that we've been doing a lot of the right things. I'd also add that I've seen something very definite because I'm on the ground every day, sort of pre-1910 and post-1910. It wasn't so much, it wasn't just that we defeated 1910, is that we, the world heard our arguments for, for why golf courses were good for the communities in which they were located, whether you played golf or not. So I'm beginning to see in processes, I mean, I was, I'm not gonna name it, but I met yesterday afternoon with a developer of a of, of what had been a daily fee course, not publicly owned, private property people can do. And in essence, wants to preserve a healthy measure of golf and is reaching out to the golf community so that we can work with them to do it the right way, as they put it. I didn't see that pre-1910. So what I'm seeing is and what you're suggesting, the evidence in one case in Capital Day, having curried really good relationships. And on the other case, um, getting the message out there that, and I'll put it crudely, don't mess with the golf industry. I mean, you know, in other words, if you if you extend your hand and want to work with us, we'll work with anybody. We're very compromising. I'm told I compromise too much. We'll go into that another day. But if you want to take a gun and put it to our head, we'll fight you. And, and, that, and both are important. And we hope, and if you can fight, if you can make a successful defense, and maybe it, when the people put a gun to your head, that prevents them from doing that again, which is exactly what we want to accomplish. And I think I use that example, which is more visceral, use the one from the Capitol, um, because my job takes me into these exciting places <laughs> where they're trying to, where, they're, where, where we have people who covet our land, because we use a lot of it. And you're a little bit more at the 30,000 foot level, but at both levels, I think your, your point is extremely well taken. And I wanna convey it to this group. We're moving in the right direction. And as you move in the right direction, you pick up a little speed over time. So let's keep it going in the right direction. And let's make sure that we, that, that we don't relax and think, well, things are going well, so maybe we don't need to focus on it or, 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 or support it with resources. The opposite is the case. If you found something that works, Keep doing it. Thank you, Craig. And of course, you know, you've been with us on every chat since we started. Thank you for keeping the pulse uh, on the uh, state of California and all its craziness uh, on a day to day basis for us. We're probably time to uh, start to wind down. Nikki? Yeah. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, thanks, Craig. And thanks to uh, the other Craig Kessler for joining us. Um, great information and great for all of you to, to get to know. Um, Craig a little bit better, and I uh, hope you get a chance to meet him. Uh, for those uh, in Southern California section, he's he's confirmed as of now to join us at our annual meeting in December, so we look forward to, to having you meet him there. Um, again, best of luck to, to our uh, section professionals representing Southern Cal and Northern Cal sections uh, next week at the championship. We look forward to watching, and uh, if you're a PGA coach, make, make sure your profile is up to date and, and get some great exposure next week, but um, Thank you and hope you all have a have a great weekend. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. And uh, as as you mentioned to both both Craig Kethos for their time, Steve Shelby for continuing to get us on the air uh, on a regular basis. And probably uh, I, I'll go out uh, far enough to say the most important thing we covered today is happy Mother's Day uh, to everyone out there. And please, uh, I hope that for those of you that it applies to, I hope that didn't come as a surprise. Uh, if, you, if it did, make sure you get to the floors or make sure you get somebody online to send that gift. So thank you all again for the great support and uh, we'll see you next month. Take care.